Good afternoon. I am Cadet Second Class Dina McFadden, NCLS Non-Commissioned Cadet in Charge. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the final session of our 23rd Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. We've had a great few days together so far. I've learned a lot. And from conversations I've had with many of you, I think we all have. Now, out of respect for the rest of the speaker lineup, I won't say that we've saved the best for last, but we are definitely going to finish strong. To set the stage, I'll tell you a little bit about our speaker for the final session, Mr. Bennett Croswell. Mr. Croswell is the president of Pratt & Whitney's Military Engines Business, where he oversees development, production, and support of the company's military offerings. His oversight includes the engines for the F-22, F-35, F-15, F-16, C-17, the KC-46A, as well as the small military engine and advanced engine program sectors. Prior to his current role, he held the position of vice president where he was responsible for all activities associated with the F-135 and F-119 engine programs. He also led Pratt & Whitney's maintenance department data and support equipment team in supporting all military and commercial product lines and providing customers with innovative and cost-effective maintenance solutions. Mr. Croswell holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Tennessee and a Master of Business Administration degree from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He also graduated from the Defense Systems Management College in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. He is a member of the University of Tennessee College of Engineering Advisory Board, the Air Force Association, the Association of the United States Army, the Army Aviation Association of America, and the Navy League. We are truly fortunate to have him with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bennett Croswell. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Cadet McFadden. Very much appreciate that introduction. It's, uh, it is great to be here. Um, you know, I was thinking, I have briefed several secretaries of the Air Force, several chiefs of staff of the Air Force. I introduced Bob Gates when he gave a speech uh, when he was Secretary of Defense. Uh, many, many uh, experiences like that. And there's something about 2,000 cadets that make me just about as nervous right now than I've ever been to give a speech. So, uh, so let's have a little fun instead. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about leadership. Let me thank the superintendent of the academy, the dean of faculty, and the, and the commandant um, for allowing me to be here today. I'm, I, I'm truly honored. Um, and I'm honored to be batting cleanup here with such a strong group of speakers. I mean, that, you, you really had the benefit of a strong group of speakers, notwithstanding your cleanup batter. But uh, it's really a great opportunity to talk to you, future Air Force leaders. And I got to tour the Aero Lab, seeing some of the great work that's being done there. So as, uh, as Cadet McFadden said, I am the president of Military Engines. I did start at Pratt Whitney in 1979. As, as she said, I graduated from the Harvard of the South, the University of Tennessee. Uh, my, my, go Vols, uh, with a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, I can tell you that uh, it was all I could do to get out of mechanical engineering school. I left with about a 2.7 GPA. I was fortunate back then. I was fortunate back then that Pratt Whitney was hiring people who had a 2.7 GPA. Um, it's, uh, just as an aside, recently the, the dean asked me to be on the uh, board of advisors for the College of Engineering, and I said, Dean, you might want to go check my transcript before you make that invitation. But uh, ever since then, in one way or another, the Air Force has been part of my daily working life for nearly four decades now. And it's whether I've been working on engines for the F-22 or the F-35, or just working with Air Force, Air Force leaders who I consider to be the very best in the world. And we've been lucky, too, at Pratt Whitney. Some of those great leaders have come to work for us. So names you might remember or recognize, General Fig Newton, General Bill Beggart, General Howie Chandler, and today, Lieutenant General Mike Moeller. So I've learned a lot by working side by side with these uh, Academy graduates and many other Air Force leaders as well. As you might suspect, Pratt Whitney has a culture much like the Air Force. You know, we look for leaders everywhere in the organization, from the very top to the bottom. 
the legendary Air Force General Curtis LeMay said, I'm firmly convinced that leaders are not born. They're educated, trained, and made, as in every other profession, excuse me. And in uh, many cases, in my case, I have found that to be true. So I began my career, you know, I started on July, here's how much strategy I put into my career when I started at Pratt Whitney. I said, I'm gonna start July the 2nd so I get the 4th of July off. And, uh, and I, I began my career as a performance engineer. I tried to show off in the Aero Lab that I still remember a little bit of it. My first assignment was down in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, I was truly at the bottom of the engineering totem pole, but that was okay. West Palm Beach was a pretty good place to live. I felt really lucky to be at Pratt Whitney at that time. We were about four years into what has, is now about a 42-year run of production for the F-100 engine for the F-15 and F-16. I was able to work on technology programs that became the F-119 that eventually would power the F-22 Raptor. So I was really in awe of the fact that I got to be on such cutting-edge technology and was getting paid for it at the same time. It was really great. You know, I decided early on I would treat each job, every project, every assignment as I was given as a new opportunity to grow not only in my discipline as an engineer, but also as a leader. And over the course of my career, I've had the good fortune to work for demanding leaders who expected the best from everyone on the team, including themselves. Now, at the time, I may not have believed it was good fortune, but I later came to appreciate how they got the very best out of me and how they made me achieve more than I ever thought I could. And you know what, I don't think they cared very much if I liked them or not, that wasn't part of the equation because they were focused on the mission of what we were trying to do. And that is what leaders do. Air Force doctrine says leadership is the art of influencing and directing people to accomplish a mission. As an engineer, I'm convinced it's not just an art. I think there's a little science in there too, but I think that's a solid definition. You know, considering there is no better laboratory for developing leaders than right here at the Air Force Academy, I, can hardly, I, I hardly expect that I can impart any words of wisdom that you haven't learned from your classmates or your instructors, but I've been asked to share my thoughts on the philosophy of leadership and some of the leadership principles I've tried to follow. And I hope my perspectives will be helpful to you as you develop the attributes necessary to serve and lead throughout your careers in the Air Force and throughout your lives for that matter. You know, there are many characteristics that define the mark of a true leader. And I'm gonna give you five that I think are most critical and then I'm gonna tie it back to our business and give you some examples of where I've seen those leadership traits. So I think by far the number one uh, requirement is integrity. Secondly, you need to take accountability, never to bend or to hide the truth. Third, you wanna set a bold vision. Fourth, build good teams that can get the job done. And finally, be passionate and show that by your words and your actions. You know, you might be less interested in my theories of leadership and lessons from the business world and more interested in hearing about Pratt Whitney's jet engines, but I'm gonna to try to combine both of those in my talk today. So integrity first. The very first of the, of the Air Force's three core values is integrity first. It can't be second, it can't be third. That's, that just doesn't work. It's first because integrity is fundamental to everything a leader does and a leader has to model integrity in everything they say and do. In our industry and in our profession, strict adherence to laws and regulations is a requirement. Following the law is a matter of integrity and integrity is our license for doing business. We are in the business of developing the most technological, sophisticated turbo machinery and jet engines on the planet. And because of that, we have a special responsibility to protect the technology so the United States can maintain our lead in gas turbine propulsion. So we faced a crisis in our co company a few years ago that stemmed from the breakdown of following export laws to the letter uh, to a T. And a division of Pratt Whitney that builds engines for civil, general aviation, small business jets, turboprops, regional aircraft, and helicopters um, had, a, had an issue with this company with more than 48,000 of these small engines and operations around the world. The company is a, has a sterling reputation as a world leader in the design, manufacture, and service of dependable engines. But unfortunately, some of that well-earned reputation took a hit due to a single incident, a breakdown of compliance with export law. The company exported software used in civilian hel helicopters to China. But because the same technology also made its way to China's first attack helicopter, the Z-10, the company had violated the law. 
a very select group of people knew that that was happening. And the government did not appreciate it when they, they did not come forward immediately with details of what occurred. Those individuals didn't follow the standards that we all hold ourselves to and that the government rightfully demands of us. As a result, our company ple paid, pled guilty in, in the U.S. Federal District Court and we paid a $75 million fine. That single incident delivered a hit to our hard-earned in integrity and credibility, and that's expensive far beyond the dollars represented by that fine. To the company's credit and our employees and all levels of leadership, we have worked quickly to address the problem, and we've instituted company-wide controls to prevent this kind of mistake from happening again. It required changes in our training and to our business processes, and a recalibration of our mindset on, for our compliance culture, too. It was not easy. It still is not easy, but it is absolutely necessary. And fortunately, the U.S. Uh, Justice Department has said that through our considerable investment, training, and changes made by our company, they can feel the change and that we have demonstrated our commitment to export and trade compliance. And even though that incident didn't have in my, happen in my organization, we felt the impacts and the after effects, and we had to work together to make sure the entire company got back on the straight course. And I'm sharing this story with you because I think it perfectly illustrates the importance of integrity, that that has to be a bedrock principle that guides individual leaders and organizations. No matter where you are in the leadership totem pole, whether you're in the Air Force or in business, you make decisions on a daily basis that impact your own personal and organizational integrity. Character, reputation, credibility, and trust are measured by small and simple decisions that add up over time. It's important to do what you say you will do to follow regulations and orders and to do it day after day. Now, as hard as we try, we all make mistakes. But there's a big difference between making a little mistake and knowingly and purposely breaking the law, disobeying lawful orders, and so on. You don't get many opportunities in life or in our business to earn back the credit value, the credibility, and trust you might have built up over time. And if you're a leader in a position of command, you can't ignore inappropriate behavior or cover up for anything that would jeopardize your personal integrity or, or that of your organization. The legendary Hap Arnold said, function of command requires continuous alertness and willingness to accept change conditions. The single incident I shared with you occurred because leaders weren't alert. They let their guard down. That ended up affecting the integrity of the company and everyone in it and definitively changed conditions for doing business with our customers. Now, again, I'm proud to say that we stepped up on our vigilance and UTC and Pratt Whitney regained our position, position as an industry leader in export control and security, but that was a painful lesson to learn. Now, let me talk now about taking account, accountability and never bending the truth. And uh, the story I'm gonna give you doesn't come from the ch chairman's suite or from the, my boss man, the president of Pratt Whitney's office, or for, even from my office. It comes from the shop floor. A few years back on the F-135 engine program, we were facing the end of a month deadline for engine deliveries. On top of that, it was the end of the financial quarter, and Wall Street likes to see engine sales tallying up on the ledger when the company releases its earnings. The F-35 program was under tr tremendous pressure to get moving, and of course our Lockheed Martin partners down in Fort Worth were waiting for our engines to continue the assembly process of the F-35. And in the midst of, midst of this, one of our assembly mechanics noticed that a teeny seal, a little rubber ring, was missing from a tool he had used to assemble an engine. When he discovered this, the engine he had been working on had already left the floor and had been taken to a testing facility to go undergo acceptance testing, which we do right before we sell the engine. But the mechanic knew he had to say something. And at that moment, he knew he had to lead us. And I'm sure it wasn't easy. His mistake was about, about to cost the company money some, and a whole lot of grief, but he also knew he shouldn't try to fix one mistake with another. He was worried that the seal was in the engine somewhere. So he had to speak up. That was the moment he had to be a leader. He told a supervisor, and we brought the engine back and tore it down, even though it had, it had already run and ran very well. And we tore the engine down piece by piece until we found the fragments of the seal in an oil reservoir. The fix was simple, and the customer eventually got a truly ready engine, but it was delayed by a couple of weeks. And here's the important thing to know about that story, and I felt really good about this. 
Our company did not punish that me mechanic. Quite the contrary, we celebrated that mechanic. Even, as I said, even my boss man, the president of Pratt Whitney, he spoke highly and very visibly of this was the right action to take. We weren't all happy to have been late, but the mechanic was right to raise his hand. And when he saw something out of place, maybe no one would have ever known about the seal. Maybe it would have worked its way out of the engine. But Pratt Whitney couldn't take that risk. And the pilots who fly the F-35 shouldn't have to accept that risk either. And as a leader, we have to be able to admit mistakes, but it's even more important to accept honest mistakes of people on your team to foster integrity and to develop the initiative and courage to speak up. So let's talk about setting a bold vision. You know, I think that's one of the leadership uh, approaches and traits that I find most, uh, most beneficial, most impactful. You know, you can't have milk toast sort of visions. You've got to be bold. So let me give you an example. And I found out, surprisingly so, that uh, Marine Lieutenant General Robert Schmittle spoke to you this week. And my example is about General Schmittle. Because three years ago, he was serving as a Marine Corps Deputy Commandant of Aviation. And he set an ambitious goal for his service to be the first to declare initial operational capability with the Pratt Whitney powered F-35B. And he set that vision even, the B, even though the Stovall variant is by far the most technologically challenged of the three aircraft we are developing on the JSF program. He sent a memo to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy announcing the Marines intended to accomplish this goal by July of 2015. And in doing so, he drew a line in the sand and in essence told the entire F-35 program to be ready. To appreciate just how bold and audacious this goal was, it's important to understand what was required to achieve IOC. At a minimum, the Marine Corps was required to have 10 F-35Bs ready to execute close air support, offensive and defensive counter air, be able to fly to all corners of the flight envelope, and be deployment ready on day one. On top of that, this first squadron needed to come up with all its spare parts, all its tooling, trained personnel, and be able to use the complex autonomic logistics integration system, which is what the maintainers use to keep the F-35 mission ready. And from Pratt and Whitney's perspective, we were still in the days of system development and design. And we were working on a number of improvements to the engine to make it even more affordable and reliable. And as you probably know, the complexity of fifth generation fighters, like the F-135, is tremendous. The engine contains thousands of parts, far more than any other system on the F-35. Its airfoils and turbine blades require special coatings to allow the engine to operate at extremely high temperatures, many hundreds of degrees above the melting point of the materials that make up the blades. The Stovall variant's three-bearing swivel module at the back of the engine together with roll post and a lift fan in the center of the aircraft allow the F-35 to hover and to vert land vertically, producing nearly as much thrust as the engine does in full afterburning. So certainly for Pratt Whitney, the Stovall engine really is at the apex of modern manufacturing and technology. Even as advanced as the engine was, we still had to complete 12 additional engineering design changes it would, that would allow the aircraft to meet the required combat capability for IOC. Once we design, made these changes, we have to, to retrofit 27 engines and establish a fully functional F-135 engine depot with our partners at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. True leadership requires that you set some big, hairy, audacious goals. And I had a boss who called them BHAGs. And then you gotta hold people accountable to make them happen. The Marine Corps gave us a, bo a bold goal, and I'm proud to say our team was able to step up to the challenge and to meet it. Last year, US, U.S. Marine Corps IOC was a huge milestone for the program, a big accomplishment, and has really put the program on the positive vector it's on today. And it's probably no surprise to you that another tremendous leader, uh, Air Force uh, Ch Chief of Staff General Mark Welch, has set the same goal for the U.S. Air Force for August to December of this year. I like that goal, and Pratt Whitney's ready to embrace it. So now I'm going to talk about teamwork, but it starts with one of the most difficult and humbling chapters in my career as the leader of Pratt Whitney Military Engines. So two years ago, on June 23, 2014, AF-27 was hurtling down the runway at Eglin Air Force Base when the pilot heard an explosion and saw flames coming out of the rear of the aircraft. Thankfully, the pilot had not left the ground, 
we were all very, very fortunate of that. And he got out of the aircraft safely and quickly. After that, the base, uh, firefighters arrived on the scene moments later and did their job. The aircraft was towed away and locked up in a hangar. Because the Air Force had immediately kicked into high gear with the safety and accident investigations, which is what's supposed to happen, by the way, in a scenario like this, no one, none of us had access to the jet to determine what had happened. And it wasn't immediately clear what had happened or why. The only information we had were the details I just described to you. But this is what makes matters worse. This was happening only a few weeks before the F-35 international debut, debut at the uh, uh, Farnborough Air Show in the United Kingdom. Both the UK and the Marine Corps were planning to send their F-35s to the world's greatest air show, but now those plans were in limbo. I can tell you it didn't help my peace of mind to know that all over London, they were hanging signs that said, the F-35 is here. So Pratt and Whitney, and the F-35 and by extension Pratt and Whitney was going to be the toast of the show, but with two weeks to go until the show, the headlines were now saying, will the F-35 show up or not? Timing is everything. But here's the thing, even with all this drama going on and with the eyes of the world on the F-35 program and the F-35 critics having their field day, and there's a lot of them out there, trust me, I really had complete confidence in my team that we would find the fix Determine, determine what would ha happen, find a fix, or at the very least, find procedures that would allow us to fly the aircraft safely. As soon as we got the opportunity to look at the engine, only a few days after the incident, we were able to determine what had happened. And about two weeks later, the Pratt Whitney team had worked around the clock with the Joint Program Office, the Air Force, Lockheed Martin, and the other services to develop a solution. We discovered that a stationary vane called a stator in the fan section of the engine rubbed a little too much against a material that forms an air seal on the third fan rotor. That friction caused excessive heating, micro cracks formed that propagated until the fan failed. So we have a proud history of building fighter engines, but this was something we had never seen before. And to be totally honest, it's the only kind of thing you discover when you're flying the aircraft. It's not something we can pick up on the test stand uh, when we're developing the engine. But the team developed two fixes an in-flight rub-in procedure that would gradually break in the material that created the seal, or pre-trenching pre the material on the stator that would create the same effect. In the meantime, we developed an inspection that would allow maintainers to see if the engines in the field had experienced a hard rub and that those cracks might be present in the fan. And this inspection allowed us to get the fleet by, back to flying, albeit with some restrictions to the pilots. Again, time isn't everything, and it, didn't, and it turned out the F-35 didn't make it to, that, to Farnborough that year. The inspection I just mentioned would have enabled to, the aircraft to come, but in the category of things happen to me that don't happen to other people, on the very day that the United Kingdom's uh, Minister of Defense was to make the decision, he got promoted to Foreign Secretary. The new Defense Minister simply had too much on his plate that day to agree to have the F-35 come over. So the decision was made not to have the F-35 perform at the air show. Despite the outcome, and thanks to great leadership on the F-35 programs, we found a fix, corrected the issue, and we moved on. You know, when you're advancing the, late, the latest technologies, things like this are gonna happen. But it's how you react to that that really defines how good you, how good you are. You know, if you don't, push the envelope if you don't innovate or make something better. You're just sat being satisfied with the status quo. At Pratt Whitney, we just happened to innovate the world's most powerful fighter engines, and we believe that we're a generation ahead of anything out, that's out there. You know, still have bad memories about being on the stage in the UK explaining what happened to hundreds of reporters grilling us about the F-35 being a no-show at Farnborough. But I tell you what, good leaders surround themselves with a good team and then they give them the room to make things happen. And I'll stand by my team any day of the week. So, uh, you know, I was really pleased. I was at the Air Force Association meeting uh, just yesterday and, and the night before, and I got to talk to Secretary James. And Secretary James commented to me on how proud she was of how Pratt Whitney reacted to that incident and how, um, how impressed she was with how, how we reacted to it. So bad things happen. You address them vigorously and as a team, and you try to come out the other side successfully. And I think in this case, we did. 
So now I'm going to close with one last trait that I think is important. And I'm going to give you an example of somebody that many of you know who has this trait. So the trait is to be passionate. You know, you have to, you have to truly be passionate about what you're doing. If you don't support the mission 100% and if you don't have a fire in your belly to be the very best, then you aren't passionate and in my book you aren't a leader. I want to share a story with you about a gentleman who used to work for Pratt Whitney, Frank Gillette. You might not have heard of Frank before, but he's truly a passionate leader and someone that I think every candidate here should know. Frank was one of the founding fathers of Pratt Whitney's YF-119 program. He eventually led the team that developed the F-119 engine that eventually came to power the F-22. If you have seen the F-22 in flight, you know just how amazing the aircraft is. It looks like it defies the laws of physics. It performs and maneuvers in a way that don't look like they're aerodynamically possible. It can go into a vertical climb, stop accelerating, go into a tail slide, which is not good for jet engines, by the way, drop the no nose back down to level flight, swivel 180 degrees, and turn on a dime without stalling the engine, and then accelerate away. Its thrust vectoring and super maneuverabilities are capabilities that strike fear into our adversaries and make pilots drool. They simply wouldn't be possible without Frank. If you earn the opportunity to strap on an F-22 in your career, you will personally owe Frank a debt of gratitude for making one of the best engines the Air Force has ever flown. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to put Frank on the spot and ask him to be recognized since he's here with us today. Frank, would you please stand? Thanks, Frank. Frank knows a lot of what about, what, what it, about what it takes to make airplanes go fast. But he also knows that, a lot about what it takes to make them easy to work on. And that isn't the kind of thing that gets into the headlines. But when the Air Force completed the contract for the F-22, the maintainability of the engine was something they wanted very much. Frank knew we had to not only build an engine that was fast, but one that was easy to take care of. Frank's commitment to making the F-22 easy to maintain is what made the difference in much of our success over the past few decades. A few, a few little things, if you think about it, but it's extremely important to an engine maintainer. It saves time, it saves money, it prevents mistakes, and therefore it saves lives. It seems sort of unremarkable now because it's in our DNA, but when Frank was developing the F-119 decades ago, there wasn't something people thought about before we all focused on engine performance, not how easy it was to maintain the engine. Frank's commitment to this was a lonely one for a while, but he passionately believed in his mission, and he inspired the team to be passionate about it as well. They ended up designing an engine whose components could be fully disassembled using only six hand tools, when previously it took several dozen. And those components are all situated on the engine to, to, for, at, e at easy reach, and so that you don't have to take one component off to get to another. The er engine is an er ergonomic, I can't say ergonomically, designed the, and place, the components are placed such that the engine can be worked, worked on by a full-size man or the smallest woman. And the fasteners were redesigned so they would remain attached to the engine so no one would forget to replace a screw or a bolt. And when they, when they were attached, they made an audible sign so the maintainer would know they were locked down in place. The connections were color-coded to avoid mix-up. Now, Frank's a gator, a Florida gator. So unfortunately, some of those color codes were orange and blue, but they're still valuable uh, and to avoid mistakes. So in those days, we didn't have CAD drawings like we do now, so Frank personally reviewed and attached his signature of approval to the hand drawings of every F-119 part to make sure everything was done just right, and it was. Frank even made a full-size engine mock-up and took it on the road around to base to base to get input from the maintainers. So after Frank and his team felt they had the performance and maintainability characteristics just right, it was time for Frank to make his final presentation to Air Force leadership. It was like a Cecil B. DeMille Hollywood movie. They literally opened the curtain to reveal Frank in his mop gear, the Kim Bio protective suit that covers you from head to toe to demonstrate how easily the engine could be maintained even in the most challenging deployment conditions. The performance got him a standing ovation from the Air Force leaders and it probably helped us win the competition to build the engine. 
Frank was truly a passionate and visionary leader and someone that Pratt Whitney and the Air Force should be proud of. That is why today I am pleased to announce that, that the USAFA endowment has created a research position at the United States Air Force Academy, the Frank Gillette Propulsion Re Researcher to support cadet-centered propulsion research in the Department of Aeronautics. Frank had a major role in designing and developing almost every engine that powers the U.S. Air Force frontline fighter aircraft, including the thrust vectoring super cruising power plant of the F-22 Raptor. And it is extremely fitting to create this position in his name, and Pratt Whitney is proud to sponsor this effort. I personally want to thank Major General retired Mark Volchev, the new US Air, USAFE Endowment CEO, his predecessor, General retired Stephen Lorenz, Jennifer Bateman, who's Vice President of Development, and Colonel Neil Barlow for their tireless work to make this researcher endowment a reality. So let me just wrap up. So let, let me just wrap up. I hope, I hope you can integrate these leadership principles into your personal leadership philosophy. I tried to share a, a few examples from my leadership experiences to illustrate how these principles apply to me. And I hope that they're equal, equally important, probably even more important to you as you go on to serve as officers and leaders in our United States Air Force. I know one of your core values and that you know very well, but you'll never go wrong if you always put integrity first. Remember, any of the, even the smallest decision you make can have consequences. Always take personal accountability. Never bend the truth, no matter what. It's easy enough to remember when you are responsible for big things, but you have to be responsible for the small things too, like a missing seal. No detail is too small when it comes to personal accountability. Set a bold vision. Do hard things. Expect the very best of your team and give them an ambitious goal to aim for. Whether that means developing a new weapon system or setting sights on becoming the best in your chosen profession, you can't get it done without stretch objectives. You've got to stretch yourself and your team if you hope to accomplish anything remarkable. Build good teams that get the job done. Surround yourself with excellence. You want the best people around you. You don't want a wingman who you can't rely on. When you're a leader, you will have the confidence in your ability to get the job done if you know that the people who support you are the absolute best at what they do. Find those people and help them thrive in your organization. And lastly, be passionate, like my friend Frank, and show that passion by your words and actions. Frank is one of the most passionate leaders I have ever known. That passion, I think you all feel it still today here at the U.S. Air Force Academy in the Aeronautics Department, where he does a lot of work even today. Um, the accomplishments that we've had are in, are in no small measure due to passionate people like Frank, who strive to do the very best for themselves and for the people that, that rely upon them. So uh, it has truly been an honor to be here today. Um, when I was asked to uh, present on leadership, you know, I, I had to think about it and say, well, you know, I like to think I'm a good leader, but I don't, to such a great group of cadets and in such a great venue, uh, I am truly honored. And it's, it's just been great to be here today and to, to see what you do here. And I wish you the very best in the rest of, your, uh, get the rest of your schooling and in your Air Force career. Thank you very much. So I would be very pleased to take questions, questions on leadership, questions on jet engines, questions on Air Force's perspective from industry, whatever you'd like to talk about. I'll talk Tennessee football with you. I'd be glad to do that. Um, sir, Cadet First Class Garnett, CSO3. Uh, I don't like Tennessee football, just That's to start okay. that off. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, you work on these engines and you work with these, these groups that create these engines. Um, have you ever flown in an aircraft that has used one of these engines? I have not. I have not flown in a fighter aircraft yet. Okay. So. And uh, also, you work with Lockheed Martin and all these different organizations. I, if I could stop you. I have okay. made one arrested landing and I have one cat shot off of the USS Harry S. Truman on a E2C COD propeller-driven airplane. So that was pretty exciting. 
Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, and then I wanted to wonder, uh, or I guess I do wonder, um, with all these projects you do, are there any cool research and development projects that are in the works right now yeah. that you could talk to us about? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention two. Um, we are working on uh, adaptive cycle engines. So you know how engines, like commercial engines, they're high bypass ratio, they're, they're tuned for fuel economy. And then you have fighters engines like the F-22, uh, the F-135 and the F-119 that are tuned more for performance. We're working on engines that can shift between both of those modes. We call them adaptive engine cycles. We have a program now out of AE, AE, uh, AFRL, AETD, and that's going to shift to a, a follow-on program, excuse me, AETP, where we, where we will be working on those technologies. The other thing we're working on is a helicopter engine for the new helicopter engine for the Black Hawk and Apache called the HPW 3000. We do that in partnership with Honeywell, who it's a joint venture. We have demonstrated uh, fuel consumption improvements of over 20% relative to the engines that are in the Black Hawk and Apache today. And we look forward to getting a contract from the U.S. Army to continue development of those engines. Um, so we've got a lot going on in, in the uh, n next generation, sixth generation of engine technologies and in rotorcraft. Thank Thanks. you very much, sir. Thank you. Cadet First Class, Kimberly Webb, CS24. I had a question with regards to the F-35 vertical takeoff engine. Yep. To my understanding, the current issue with the F-35 vertical takeoff engine is that it cannot necessarily take in small debris, such as being within sandy or basically desert conditions, which the Marines tend to want to use it for. Au contraire. Not true. <laughs> my sources were wrong. Uh, respectfully, I say au contraire, not true. <laughs> no. We have uh, very purposely designed the engine to be FOD tolerant. So the leading edges of the uh, compressor and fan airfoils, you know, to be most efficient, you would have that almost like a razor. But we very purposely have them with blunt, rounded edges so they can be FOD tolerant. Now, now your point is, um, is well taken in that FOD is bad on jet engines, uh, but we have designed for that. And what we are able to do without removing the engine from the aircraft is to boroscope blend and repair blades that have been dinged by FOD. So uh, there's a lot of focus on this. And, um, and we, our experience in the field so far with regard to FOD hasn't been bad at all. I will say the Marine Corps has not been doing as much, we call it mode four or vertical takeoffs, and short takeoffs and vertical landings. You know, one of the reasons why they haven't been doing that many of them is because it's so easy. They, they, you pretty much just hit a button and everything transitions down and uh, they don't have to practice it that much. So we've designed for that, we've taken that into account. So far we haven't had a lot of experience where it's been a big issue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, C2C Tyson, uh, Squadron 8, Swoopum. Um, uh, extrapolating off of that last question, there have been a lot of criticisms ever since the JSF program's inception. And I was wondering, as someone who's closely tied in with that program, what is the single greatest misconception that you would like to correct? Well, I think the one that, and I was surprised when I went over to Farnborough, excuse me, Royal International Air Tattoo in the UK last summer, um, it was right after they, a report had come out that an F-35 couldn't out dogfight an F-16. And I was amazed at how that stuck. And people were walking around talking about that. And it's really just ridiculous. Because if you're flying an F-35, you see the F-16, he doesn't shoot you. You shoot him in the face, and that's it. So, <laughs> you know, that... The jet, the jet wasn't designed to be a dogfighter. The F-22 is our air supremacy fighter. And the F-35, you know, we, we, just like the F-15, F-16, we have, we have a high-low mix. I say we, I mean the Air Force. We have a high-low mix, mix in our fighters. The F-22 is the high, high end of that, air supremacy. The F-35 is more a ground pounder. But that said, you know, with stealth, you're not going to get in a lot of dogfights. So that one just is crazy. The, the, let me, uh, here, I'm on a roll now. <laughs> so let's, let's look at three countries. Israel, South Korea, and Japan. Now who lives in more difficult neighborhoods than Israel, 
South Korea, and Japan. Nobody. What fighter did they choose? They chose the F-35. Thank you, sir. Thanks for that question. I liked it. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. My name is Cadet Saunders from Detachment 630. Uh, I was wondering if you could extend any advice to young individuals pursuing a an, uh, career in engineering. Well, um, first of all, I think you've picked a great field of study. Um, you know, I kidded about my academic career, and, and that, but engineering gives you a great discipline in the way you think. And I think that served me well, notwithstanding my 2.7 GPA. But, uh, you know, I think what I would tell you as you go into your careers, no matter what you do, and not just in engineering, you know, I tell people when they ask for career advice, I say do three things. Find something you want to, to do that's important. Find something that you enjoy and find something that you can make a contribution to. If you do all three of those things, good things are going to happen to you. You know, and so that, that's the advice I think I would, that's the advice I give to people and I would give to you as well. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Fowler from the Civil Air Patrol. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to the civilian side. I know a lot of us here in this room are looking at military careers, but could you talk about your advancement through Pratt & Whitney and maybe offer some advice for those of us going into the civilian yeah. sector? Well, I think I followed the, the, uh, the rule I just talked about. Um, I, you know, I was very lucky. I have to admit, timing is everything in life. Uh, that's what I talked about in the speech. Uh, you know, I, first of all, I got a very good uh, technical foundation that has served me very well um, over my years. So I think it's important to whatever field you're in to gain a strong foundation of uh, whatever field of endeavor you're in. So that was very important to me. Um, then I think you, consistent with my speech, I think you have to find your passion. And I was really passionate about working with our customers. Uh, and that's not only the uniformed services, but also our airframe customers, too. So, you know, I've worked with Lockheed. I was a field rep out in California for a couple of years. I worked with them on the Navy AX program. I worked with them on the JSF program, concept dem demonstrator program, F-22, J uh, JSF. I just had a passion on work, because I like to work with people. And, uh, and I think in that way, I thrived. And so I would recommend you just find something you're really just passionate about. Um, so I, I'd, I'd say those are the two things that, that and, and timing worked for me. It really did. I got really lucky a couple of times. Um, and sometimes, too, you've got to do things that you're not sure you want to do but are hard. Um, I know when I was working the JSF Concept Demonstrator Program, I felt like I was in the middle of a war. I mean, we were, I was on the Lockheed team, and, uh, and I got tapped to be the assistant to the president the assistant to the job I have now. And I, was, and I was, felt like I had been taken from the front lines to the back lines. But I worked in that job for two years, and I can't tell you how much I learned. So sometimes you've got to do things that take you out of your comfort zone. Um, but that will benefit you, too. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Miles Dalby, class of 87. I'm an old aircraft maintenance officer. And so all the things you told me about what uh, Frank did for those engines and such. Frank, thank you very much from every maintainer. Yep, that's right. Kev, first class, uh, Shane Riley from CS22. I don't know if you can answer this question, but you said you can answer questions in regards to the industry's perspective. Yep. So President Eisenhower once uh, warned about the military industrial complex yep. and the uh, merging between defense contractors and the military. And my question is, as we're kind of seeing with the Department of Defense budget in jeopardy and going down, we're seeing more political activism from defense contractors into that process. So we're here to learn about leadership and integrity. And my question is, is that involvement um, generally a good thing? And is it maybe counter to free market enterprise? When you say political activism, could you give me more about what you see that industry may be doing? So uh, we see a lot of shifting from, uh, I guess, maybe money and in industry towards um, political campaign funds have close to uh, doubled, I think, within the past yep. 30 years, yep. uh, lobbying groups, stuff like that. Well, um, I think, I don't think there's a dis, I'm 
make sure I answer this right. I think a lot of times when we do, I, I think a lot of times when we do lobbying, it's uh, to benefit Pratt Whitney, but it also benefits the systems that many times the Air Force and the other services want to take advantage of too. Now I'll admit there'll be times. I think the retirement of the A-10 is a great example, although I don't, I don't know any, uh, those aren't our engines, by the way. Um, but, you know, there's something the Air Force wants to do and, po and uh, Congress is putting pressure on them, not allowing them to retire the A-10. I, I, I'm not aware of contractors uh, pushing that agenda. Um, but there are times where we push an agenda that's counter to what our customers want to do. But I want to tell you, that doesn't happen very often. Because your customers tend to remember when you do that. And uh, so I think, you know, I, I think you all know Chief of Staff Mark Welch, who I think is one of the most inspirational leaders in the world. And he talked yesterday at his speech at AFA, and he brought people from the industry. He showed a puzzle, and he says, all of you are pieces in the puzzle. And he brought up airmen and, and chief engineers and from the, from the Air Force. But he also brought up the chief engineer of the KC-46A from Boeing, and he brought up Al Norman, who's the chief test pilot from Lockheed Martin. And he said, you know, he, go, he said, this is my team. And he was making a very important point, and that is industry, you know, we deliver the hardware that you guys go and fight the wars for us, and we gotta do it together. And I think generally, 95, 98% of the time, we do it together in a great partnership. And, um, and it, you know, I talked about like, I like to work with a team. The Air Force team is one that I really treasure my relationship with and, and I like to work with. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Afternoon, sir. I'm Caroline Wu, biomedical engineering at Georgia Tech. From an industry standpoint, what is the average timeline of product development from idea iteration oh. to engine testing implementation? Oh my gosh. <laughs> we are a long cycle business. So let me talk to you about the Joint Strike Fighter program. So when I was a field rep in California, we were working on the DARPA A. Stovall program. This is in 1992. And then we did the concept demonstrator program in the late 90s. And then we did the uh, October of 20, 2001, we got the system design and development contract to develop the F-35. And here we are in 2016. <laughs> what? <laughs> What'd I do? Oh. Okay. Well, I'm glad there were no alumni from 2001 or else. <laughs> Here we are in 2016 and... <laughs> and here we are today. And, and uh, by the end of this year, we'll have our second IOC. The Navy still will not be an IOC. So I'll let you do the math. We are a long cycle business, but the products we develop are long cycle too. So I think the first B-52 hit the tarmac 60 years ago, and we're going to fly it till 20, 40, or 50. So uh, it's a long cycle business. So it takes a long time. That's, that's a long answer to uh, your very good question. Thank you, sir. Afternoon, sir. Uh, C2C Wormuth from CS19. Uh, with the commercial side of PW suffering a little bit, uh, Boeing is switching almost exclusively to GE. Um, slight delays with the uh, A320neo program. Uh, how do you keep the military side of the house motivated and wanting, wanting to keep working? Well, let me address the commercial part first. Um, so we are having some teething pains with our new geared turbofan. Um, but we're going to get through that. Um, and we've hit our performance dead on. And most commercial aircraft engines, when they come out, they miss their performance by 5 or 6%. We've hit it dead on. Um, our competitors, about six months behind us, they'll have their issues too. This, this is a BHAG, it's hard. Um, so, and I'll admit to you, we, we are disappointed that, we are, that Boeing is uh, sole source with our competitor, but we also have sole source positions with Bombardier AC Series, um, with Embraer, uh, with their new E-Jet, Mitsubishi Regional Jet, uh, a new Russian single aisle, the MC-21. Uh, that said, and to your very good point, um, early on of a commercial program, 
success is bad because you essentially, it's like razor ba blades, you know, you give, give away the, blade, the razor to sell the blades. We have something called negative engine margin and we essentially make a concession for every commercial engine we sell. So it's a, it's a drain on our finances, quite frankly. You do that because you get on the other side of it and you get into sustainment and the spare parts are lu very lucrative. So that said, how do I keep the team focused? I don't have, that is not a problem. Um, all of us who work in military engines, uh, we, we, are, we feel the mission. We are very focused on the mission and, uh, and what we have to do to make you successful. And so, um, you know, our guys, our women, they work a long time, they work long hours, long days, because they feel that mission. And um, I think that's why they work in military engines, because they appreciate it. And a lot of them, I have to admit too, are, are veterans. Um, and so they still have it in their heart as well. So it's a, it's a sporty business, the jet engine business, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good balance between commercial and military, because we are cash positive. You know, when we sell an engine, we make money. And so it, it, it provides a good balance for our business. Thank you, sir. We have time for one more question. Okay, we have time for one more question. Who has the easiest question? <laughs> Probably me, sir. So. C1C Wyatt Bertrand from CS19 as well. I've heard many, I've read many articles in the news about Pratt and Whitney's um, uh, recent breakthrough through the geared turbofan, right. which boasts um, about a 16 percent increase in fuel efficiency or thrust specific fuel, fuel consumption. I'm not he did. Not sure me. which one. But um, do you have, does Pratt & Whitney have any plans to lobby the geared turbofan towards military engines such as the, an engine for the C-17 or KC-135? Yeah. It was funny, I was talking to the head of, definitely we will offer our commercial geared turbofans um, for military application. You know, the gear allows us to have a very large fan, which is a very, allows for a very uh, good efficiency. So the gear doesn't play in an embedded application like a fighter. But for uh, a uh, tanker or transport, definitely. So I was talking to uh, the head of AMC, Air Mobility Command, and he was talking about how he wanted new engines for the C-17, which I was disappointed to hear because those are our engines on that wing right now. But uh, the problem there, there is that there is no engine in that thrust class, no modern technology engine in that thrust class to go re-engine the C-17. Um, where there are new modern technology engines are in the Boeing and Airbus aircraft that the other cadet mentioned, and on the twin aisle side, on the bigger side. Boeing is looking at a new program they were, they were calling it middle of the market, which is a Boeing 757 replacement. And that, in, that program will develop an engine in the thrust range of 40 to 45,000 pounds of thrust, which will be a candidate for the C-17. But that'll be in about eight or nine or 10 years. So uh, it'll be a ways away. But we look forward to bringing the geared turbofan technology to military applications in the future because it it's game changing. Thank you very much, sir. You're very welcome. Thank you. Sorry.